in this presentation, we will be talking about myasthenia gravis. Your myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disorder that would affect the myoneural junction, characterized by varying degrees of weakness of your voluntary muscles. In your myasthenia gravis, there is negative motors. However, the sensation and coordination are okay. okay. There is no problem in sensation and coordination. But there is a problem in motors. Now, in the pathophysiology of your myasthenia gravis, antibodies would destroy or block your acetylcholine receptor sites. So, class, take note, this is an autoimmune disorder, meaning it is our own immune system which is attacking our acetylcholine receptor sites. Unlike the previous disorders that we have discussed, here the problem is acetylcholine. In your previous disorders, the problem is on the myelin sheath of your nerves. Now, because of this destruction class, fewer receptor sites are available for your patient. Hence, there is impaired transmission of impulses across your myoneural junction. This impaired transmission class combined with the fewer receptors available would lead to the primary sign and symptom of your myasthenia gravis, which is your muscle weakness. Now, class, one of its pathophysiology is related to your thymus gland. Okay? Uh, it says that your thymus gland is the source of the autoantigen that would trigger the autoimmune response. Other than that, there are cases of your myasthenia gravis that is considered to be drug-induced. Okay? Drug-induced myasthenia gravis are usually caused by your penicillamine and your interferon alpha. Now, since you're talking here about the thymus gland, later on you will see that one of the procedures that could help a patient with MG or your myasthenia gravis is your thymectomy or the removal of your thymus. So, class, uh, this is an illustration of what's happening in your myasthenia gravis. So, in a muscle cell, uh, usually, your acetylcholine is released in the synapses, and then your acetylcholine, which is the major neurotransmitter of your parasympathetic nervous system, will be acting on the acetylcholine receptor sites. But what happens in your myasthenia gravis is that there are antibodies against the receptors, and it is this antibody that would attach themselves to the receptor sites okay, or destroy the receptor sites. For that reason, class, even if there are available levels of your acetylcholine, your patient's acetylcholine will not be able to reach the receptor sites because, again, it is already destroyed by your um, antibodies. Okay. Hence, the main problem in your myasthenia gravis, again, is the lack of your acetylcholine receptor sites. Okay. So, the same is the illustration shown here. Now, clinical manifestations. So, class, your myasthenia gravis would have your ocular and facial form. Okay. So, in your ocular and facial form, it would present with diplopia and ptosis. So, double vision and the drooling of your eye okay, or the drooling of your eyelids class uh, or drooping, I mean, of your eyelids is among the most frequent early sign of your myasthenia gravis. There is facial weakness which will present as bland facial expression, snarl, or grimace. Your patient would have difficulty in speaking, okay, and difficulty also in swallowing, I mean, which is your dysphagia, and then your patient would have dysphonia or voice impairment. Okay, so take note, this would already involve your voice box. Okay? Other manifestations for your musculoskeletal, there is weakness or fatigue. So weakness in the legs class when climbing the stairs is the first manifestation that your patient with myasthenia gravis would have. And then class weakness in the legs when uh, climbing your stairs, again, is the first manifestation. Then you have your weakening of your intercostal muscles. This is what we don't want to happen because if your intercostal muscles will be weakened, so we'll have a problem with your uh, we have a problem with your breathing. There is also a decrease in diaphragmatic movement by which we do not like because it could possibly lead to respiratory um, arrest. Then your patient in severe forms class would be breathless, dysnic, and then there is poor gas exchange. There is also class your neonatal myasthenia. So your neonatal myasthenia is characterized by a weak cry and sucking reflex and then poor movement of the limbs and the face. That's why class we always advise our patients that they need to bring their baby back to the clinic for a well baby checkup. Okay, so take note that checks checkups are not only done for the purpose of uh, disease uh, cure class, but it is also done to detect the problems of the patient earlier in life. 
Okay? So you have your complications. There are two major complications for your myasthenia gravis. One is your myasthenic crisis, and then the other one is cholinergic crisis. Class, your myasthenic crisis is usually caused by your underdosage. Okay? So I would usually uh, tell my students that when you talk about myasthenic crisis, okay, picture a letter M and then the arrow is pointing downwards, which would remind you that myasthenic crisis is indeed caused by underdosage. And then if you would look at cholinergic crisis, okay, letter C, okay, um, letter C uh, could uh, be caused by overdosage. Okay? Now, in your myasthenic crisis, there is a mention here of excessive stress. Because class, during excessive stress, what happens is that the demand of the body for muscular movement increases. Okay, so supposedly it is your muscles that would augment the need, for example, for heat of your body. Now, because of this excessive stress, the body would perceive that there is a need for more acetylcholine receptor sites. Okay, so that's why your patient would have your myasthenic crisis. Now, so, let us differentiate your myasthenic crisis from your cholinergic crisis along the discussion. So, in your myasthenic crisis class, this is usually sudden exacerbation. Okay? So, kumbaga, this is a, a severe form of your myasthenia gravis. Take note, there is severe generalized weakness, and then there is respiratory and bulbar weakness. So, class, when I say bulbar, no, okay, you might be wondering what is that bulbar. Okay, class, that is already an old term, actually, for your brain stem, your um, medulla oblongata. Okay? So, class, in your myasthenic crisis, uh, the main problem that you would want to address is respiratory failure. If we are anticipating respiratory failure, class, we would intubate our patient. Okay? Then you have your uh, respiratory infection. So, class respiratory infection is common because um, your patient is unable to cough out. And then for your surgery in pregnancy, that may be an added stress on the part of your patient. Hence, they cannot increase class their dose of medication, so they need to see the physician for the increase of the dose of medication. And then um, it could be change or under medication and then miss dose of your medication. That's why if we are managing patients with chronic illnesses class, such as this of your myasthenia gravis, okay, you need to inform the patient that they need to comply with the medications or else myasthenic crisis would occur. So what are the signs and symptoms of your um, myasthenic crisis? So you'd have tachycardia, you'd have tachypnea, there is severe respiratory distress, you'd have dysphagia, difficulty of swallowing, you have your dysarthria, your patient has a tendency to be restless, and then there is impaired speech, anxiety, and then the drooping of your eyelids, which is your ptosis, and then your diplopia, okay? Diplopia, which is your double vision. Now, you have your cholinergic crisis. So, class, in cholinergic crisis, as I have mentioned, the letter C is a writing, um, is a being written as O, okay, or over dosage. Okay, so again, class, this is over medication of your cholinesterase inhibitor or your anti cholinesterase. Okay, so what are the manifestations? So you have your GI symptoms, there is severe muscle weakness, there is a vertigo, there is respiratory distress, and then the muscle tone does not improve after giving your tensilon. So they call in your pharmacology that you have your tensilon, and then the generic name of your tensilon is your hydrophonium chloride. Okay, so let's talk about your tensilon test later on. In your cholinergic crisis class, still the same. No? You have neuromuscular respiratory failure, and then you have negative respiratory force, and then negative vital capacity. So your class, in other words, no, the functioning of your lungs are already decreased. Now, class, uh, in your neuromuscular respiratory failure, take note that this is a very critical uh, complication, and which usually be uh, coupled with this uh, first two, or the next two, I mean class, as the first clinical signs. <clears throat> okay, so class, the first clinical sign would include your negative respiratory force and then your negative vital capacity. Now, so we are mentioning about your edrophonium chloride. So class, the brand name for your edrophonium is Tensilon. That's why the test is uh, referred to as your Tensilon test. Class, the Tensilon test is being used to diagnose your myasthenia gravis. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, class, recall that in your myasthenia, our problem is your acetylcholine. So, class, your edrophonium is an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. In other words, class, uh, it inhibits the action of your acetylcholinesterase. Supposedly, your acetylcholinesterase is the one that would destroy your 
uh, that will destroy your acetylcholine. However, class, in this case, we are trying to inhibit already your acetylcholinesterase. Okay, so that's why you have your acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Now, since class, this medication is expected to relieve the signs and symptoms of a patient with myasthenia gravis, okay, your edrophonium is used as a diagnostic test. Okay, why a diagnostic test class? This is just a short acting, no? This is a short acting um, chemical, okay, or uh, short acting medication. In other words, class, uh, within 30 seconds after or even a minute after, you would see resolution of signs and symptoms. So again, if I have a patient, for example, who presents with weakness and facial asymmetry, okay, and then, um, and then I will be injecting uh, or I will be checking on the use of your edrophonium chloride glass, okay? Uh, if your patient has myasthenia gravis, okay, the signs and symptoms on the face would already be resolved. However, class, if upon injection, there is no improvement on the signs and symptoms of the patient, you consider other problems, okay? Now, it could also differentiate between your myasthenic and your cholinergic crisis. Recall, class, that myasthenic crisis is because of under dosage. Okay, so class, what happens is that if I am with a patient with myasthenic crisis, I will do my tenselon test. It will also um, <clears throat> it will also uh, improve the signs and symptoms of your patient. So again, if I will be doing your tenselon test to a patient with myasthenic crisis, okay, it's referred to as positive. Okay, it's referred to as your positive test for your tenselon test. Okay. Now, cholinergic crisis. We mentioned earlier that cholinergic crisis is an overdosage. Okay, so class, since it is an overdosage, by the time that you will be uh, injecting your uh, tensilon to your patient, what would happen is that it will aggravate the condition of your patient. Okay, if that is cholinergic crisis, if that aggravating, there may be no resolution to the signs and symptoms of your patient. Okay, take note of that. Now, as I have mentioned, no, the positive test class would be facial muscle weakness and ptosis that would resolve in five minutes. Okay, so again, this is a short-acting medication. Then you have your antidote. When you are doing this test class to your patient, you need to prepare the antidote. And the antidote for your tensilon is your atropine sulfate. Okay, atropine sulfate. Now, you also have your eyes test. Plus your eyes test, no? in this procedure, you would just place an ice pack over the eye. So this is usually indicated for patients with cardiac conditions or asthma. Okay, so class, the ice pack is being placed for about one minute and then class, atosis will just remove or resolve temporarily. So for the clients with cardiac condition class or asthma, that will contraindicate the use of your hydrophonium. Okay, so if not, then we are using your eyes test. Now, you have other diagnostic tests. One is your EMG. So, class, your EMG, your electromyography, would show reduced amplitude of action potential in response to the electrical stimulation. Then you have your anti-acetylcholine receptor antibody serum levels. So, class, uh, in myasthenia gravis, the test would appear to be positive, meaning, class, there is a presence of anti-acetylcholine receptor antibodies. Okay, then your chest CT scan class uh, is used to evaluate for your thymus gland and to check for thymoma. Okay, thymoma or the presence of abnormal growth in your thymus gland. So look at the location of your thymus gland. It's just located between your lungs. Okay. Now, other diagnostic tests. So you have your pulmonary function test, which is used class to identify the degree of respiratory involvement. And then, class, you also have your single fiber EMG, which is the most sensitive test to confirm the diagnosis and detect the failure in neuromuscular transmission. Then, so you have your medications. So, what are the medications that we are using for these patients? Okay, so you have your acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. So, again, acetylcholinesterase is the one breaking down your acetylcholine. So, we are trying to inhibit it. One class of the drugs under this category is your pyridostigmine. Okay, a common brand name is your mestinone. But take note of the adverse effect of this medication. Okay, so if your patient um, okay, will be taking several amount of a medication in a day class, okay, that would mean that your patient is at risk for cholinergic crisis. Okay, 
then uh, you have the following health teaching if your patient is taking pyogastigmine. So there should be administered with a small amount of food. You are supposed to eat 45 minutes to one hour after taking the drugs and then avoid the following substances. So you avoid magnesium, morphine, your kinin, which is an anti-malarial. Then your procainamide, hypnotics, sedatives, neomycin, polymycin, and tetracycline. So these substances need to be avoided. Then we have your immunosuppressants because again, we are considering an autoimmune problem here. And since autoimmune, so we are talking about your cyclosporine. Okay, so your cyclosporine with your glucocorticoids and then it is expected to inhibit your T lymphocytes and reduce your acetylcholine receptor antibody level. Okay, and then the adverse effect class will be your leukopenia, leukopenia and hepatotoxicity. So when I say leukopenia class, there is a decrease in the amount of your WBCs. Hence, you would need to institute uh, reverse uh, isolation for this patient. You also need to educate your patient on preventing infection. And the class hepatotoxicity, meaning we are uh, measuring or we are determining your uh, amount of uh, what you call this SGPT and SGOT okay, to monitor for your hepatotoxicity. Then you have your IVIG. So class, your IVIG would act to destroy and neutralize the autoantibodies and block the production of your new autoantibodies. So class, your uh, IVIG is actually among the expensive medications that are being used by our patients. So that would even depend on the weight of your patient, the amount of bottles that they will be needing. Okay. So class, in this case, the adverse effects when we are administering this medication would include your headache, okay, migraine, exacerbation, and then class, you have your aseptic meningitis, meaning inflammation of your meninges, okay, uh, where is, wherein there is no bacterial involvement. And then you have your flu-like symptoms. Okay? Then you have class your uh, management or administration for a patient with IVIG. You are supposed to do it in room temperature. It should directly come from the bottle. You are not supposed to transfer it to other uh, devices. And then class, uh, there should uh, this one does not contain any antimicrobial preservative. Okay? No antimicrobial preservative. So for that reason, it is only good for within six hours. And then uh, when we are doing your venoclysis or uh, when you are uh, administering your patients with IVIG, you need to start with the smallest vein. Okay, or start with the smallest vials, I mean. So why is that so, class? In such a way that if there will be an allergic reaction or allergic response to your IVIG, you will not be wasting several vials for your patient. Okay? So you have the surgery. So the surgery class is your thymectomy. So thymectomy is recommended if this is done within the first two years of diagnosis. Beyond that, uh, the prognosis, even if surgery is done, is quite poor. And then you still have your plasma pheresis. The purpose of your plasma pheresis is to do your plasma exchange and to treat the exacerbation of this condition. So plus you have the following nursing diagnosis for a patient with myasthenia gravis. So we are still working on airway clearance, swallowing. Then you have your activity intolerance, altered role confusion. You have your impaired social interaction, your self-care deficit because, of course, they could not move around. And then, class, you have your risk for injury among these patients. Okay, so that will be all for your myasthenia gravis. We'll be talking next about your Parkinson's disease. Thank you once again for your attention.